Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki, and welcome to the 391st Imagine program and another virtual Imagine Greater Buffalo lecture hosted by the downtown Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. The program is created by the Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature, or I pronounce the acronym Cezanne, and ImagineLifelongLearning.com. We're going to start with our speakers shortly, uh, but first a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 to 20 minutes. We'll have time for questions at the end. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and the library's YouTube channel pages. As a reminder, we'll be here on Zoom at the same link every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Now, today is the third Tuesday of the month, so our primary theme is history. Uh, as a community, we look back to better understand how to imagine our future. <clears throat> For several years prior to last March and COVID-19, the Noon Hour Imagine series had a video from the Great Courses series. A total of nine videos were screened uh, tied to our weekly themes. Today's featured speaker is Reverend Joan Montagnus, who was scheduled to speak following the screening of the video, Emerson, Thoreau, and the Transcendentalist Movement. This video and other Great Courses videos used in the Imagine series are, is available for rental from the library. The Reverend Joan Montagnus was raised in Toronto, Ontario. She received a Bachelor of Science from the University of Toronto, a Master of Science from the University of Alberta, and a Master of Divinity from Meadville Lombard Theological School. Over the last 26 years, Reverend Montagnus has served congregations in Edmonton, Alberta, Beaconsfield, Quebec, Toronto, Ontario, Winnachi, Washington, Moscow, Idaho, and Bellevue, Washington. She began serving the Unitarian Universalist Church of Buffalo five years ago in 2015 and continues there to this day, much to our community's good fortune. And now let's welcome Reverend Joan Montagnus, who is going to talk about Unitarian Universalism. Joan? Hello, everybody. I am. Reverend Joan Montagnus, and I have the pleasure and the honor of serving the Unitarian Church of Buffalo. I'm going to tell you a little bit about us, our history, our theology, and our practice. That's our church, by the way, and our bell tower, and yes, we do have bats there. But first, before I go into the uh, bat, the whole history, theology, and whatnot, I want to give you a backstory. And in fact, before we even do that, I want to talk about some definitions. And the first one is because people generally can't even say our name, let alone know what it means. I'll tell you what a Unitarian is. A Unitarian is someone who believes in the unity of the Godhead, not the Trinity, not the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but that there is a single God in the Godhead. A universalist is someone who believes that God is so loving that everybody gets to go to heaven. We like to call ourselves the no hell church. <laughs> and then I want to even take a step further backwards and define the word religion. It comes from the Latin religare. And religare means to yoke or to bind again. So it, it, it's related to that same word ligament, like the word that links your, uh, the bones to the muscle. And so we have religare, meaning 
what we bind, what binds us together. Religion is what binds us together. And most religions are bound together by a creed or a set of doctrines or a set of rituals. That is not quite true for Unitarian Universalists. And I'm gonna go into that a little bit later. All right, now to the backstory. Once upon a time in the misty watercolor days of prehistory, someone got the big idea that monotheism could be the way to go. Maybe there is just one God. And I don't know where to start this story, so I'm just gonna start it at zero CE for the heck of it. And we'll say at zero CE, Jesus was born. Uh, Jesus was born, he was born into a monotheistic religion, and then he died. Uh, what happened after that is full of conjecture for a lot of folks, and it was especially a time of confusion until we got to about 325 CE. People weren't quite sure who Jesus was. Was he fully God? Was he fully human? What's my relationship to this person? We know he lived, we know he died. Some people say he was resurrected. It was very confusing. Well, around lots of things were written by lots of people though, and lots of people were talking and practicing in different ways. Around 325, Emperor Constantine shows up, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and he wants to unify his power over the whole empire. And one way to concentrate power is to make sure that everybody is practicing the same religion and believing in the same way. So we held a council in a town called Nicaea. And in that council, they held a whole pile of debates. In those debates, whoever won the debate got to basically set the rules of of Christendom for all time. And they came down with a few conclusions. And the first one is that God exists in a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, one Godhead in persons three. Also, they decided in the divinity of Jesus. God, uh, sorry, Jesus was fully divine and uh, fully human at the same time. And then they decided that there was judgment in the afterlife. In other words, you go to heaven or you go to hell. So you see right there in 325, us Unitarians and us Universalists got to be heretics. Now I really want to get into our, our backstory. Uh, the magical mystery tour, as I, as I say it, because they really are stories. We'll jump all the way ahead to 1556. Once upon a time, there was a king a named John Sigismund, and his land was nestled into the Carpathian Mountains in the tiny principality of Transylvania, no joke. It was in Transylvania, now found in Romania. Now, King John Sigismund wanted to be a good king, so he, and he wanted to know, again, like Constantine, what should be the state religion? So he held his own little council. He invited to lunch. He invited the head of the local Catholic church, the head of the Lutheran church, the head of the Reformed church, and he invited the head of the Unitarian church, who happened to be this, this guy called Francis David. King John said, what do you guys think the state religion should be? And of course, the Catholics said Catholicism. And Lutheran said, well, I think my religion should. And the Reformed Church said, I think the Reformed Church should be the state religion. And Francis David said, hey, why don't we all practice whatever we want in freedom? Why don't we have a state where you can worship as you feel fit. And indeed, that is what happened. King John Sigismund converted to Unitarianism, and he also wrote up the first edict of religious tolerance in Europe. And he was our one and only 
Unitarian King. Next, I want to talk about how we ended up getting universalism over to these shores. And as I say, people have been talking about universalism for a long time. It didn't end with the Council of Nicaea. And it sort of popped up here and there. And there was this Methodist minister named John Murray. And he lived in England. And John Murray converted to universalism. He saw the wisdom of the no hell church. And he converted to universalism. And because it was heretical, he lost all his money, all his family and everything else. He decided he would never preach again, got on a ship and floated off to the new world. Well, the ship ran aground in Cranberry Cove on a sand bank outside of it. The, off the shores of New Jersey. And so they did a little shore excursion waiting for the water to come back in, the tide to come back in and free the boat. And so John Murray went ashore and he walked through the woods into a clearing and he found this meeting house. And there was a man there named Thomas Potter. Hey there, ho there, says John Murray. What kind of meeting house is this? And Thomas Potter says, I built this meeting house and I'm waiting for a preacher who will preach the everlasting good news of universal salvation. And so John Murray did not give up preaching. He started preaching there and built uh, universalist meeting houses all up and down the Eastern seaboard. So that is how universalism got to America. The story behind Thomas Potter is not a miracle. It is explainable, but I'm not gonna go into it <laughs> with you today because I've been given a short leash. Let's move on to Unitarianism. We'll start off with William Ellery Channing. William Ellery Channing was a liberal Christian in New England. And as today, there are liberal Christians and there are conservative Christians. And the conservative Christians used to call the liberal Christians those Unitarians. It was a derogatory term because it's heretical, right? And um, William Ellery Channing was asked to preach at an ordination, and so he wrote a sermon entitled Unitarian Christianity in 1819. And he said, you wanna call us Unitarians? Call us Unitarians. But I wanna tell you what we believe. And what we believe is in the humanity of Jesus, the morality of God. So God doesn't damn people for no good reason. And use your head when you're interpreting scripture. And for that matter, everything else. So God, so Jesus is not divine. Jesus was a man, morality of God, and reason in scripture. That was William Ellery Channing's great gift to liberal religion here in the United States. Next, you might have heard of this guy, Ralph Waldo Emerson. Yes, he was a Unitarian minister. And he was asked to preach the Harvard Divinity School Address in 1838. Some of you may be familiar with that. Uh, and he introduced the concept in this Divinity School Address of transcendentalism, that concept that, that the spirit within is connected to a larger spirit without. He also talked about in that address that we should be trusting our own experience and intuition more, more than anything that anyone can teach us through words, through preaching, through scripture, that sort of thing. Trust your own experience and intuition because that is the divine light. And then he, and this is where we began to get the idea of the inherent worth and dignity of every individual is very important to us as Unitarian Universalists. It's our first principle. And of course, Emerson went on to talk about self-reliance and that also 
uh, fit into our, our concepts of rugged individualism, which has also been a real weak spot for us Unitarian Universalists. And the third person in the pantheon of, of our uh, founders in New England was poor old Theodore Parker. Theodore Parker is such a young guy, and he was following in the footsteps of Emerson. He was sure he was doing that. And he preached another ordination sermon in 1841, the transient and the permanent in Christianity. And he didn't think he was doing any big deal. And he, but this is what he said. And remember, this is, this is early on. He was saying, he said, you know, in religion, the transient are all those rituals, all those scriptures, all those councils, all those creeds, all those doctrines, all those practices. They're just dust in the wind. The only thing that is permanent in religion and in Christianity is love of God and neighbor. And he brought forth this concept of social practice, social justice as faith practice, which we hold very dearly to today. Now, at the time, that was so rad, so radical, that he was completely blacklisted and unable to preach in other pulpits in New England. And I just want to give you some more final historical milestones 1863, Olympia Brown was ordained, first woman ordained in the United States, ordained by St. Lawrence College, and, which is a universalist college, although she was a Unitarian. 1933, the Humanist Manifesto was signed, written and signed by Unitarians and Universalists. And what this manifesto says is that you do not need God to be religious. You can be a person of faith and not necessarily worship God. And, you know, once you do that, you open the floodgates. And so into our churches started filing, well, atheists and agnostics and pagans and Buddhists and Jews and Muslims and on and on, Taoists, on and on it went. And that is, in fact, true today, that if you come to our church, you will find sitting in all the pews a diversity of theological stances because we are not held together by doctrine or dogma or creed. We are held together by covenants of mm, relationship and faith. Last date I wanna share with you is it's 1961. It's when the Unitarians and the Universalists merged to form a single faith tradition, and we became the Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations. And that wraps up the backstory. I know it was a fire hose of history. There's so much more. But now let us talk about Unitarian Universalism in Buffalo today. Welcome to our church. There it is at the corner of Elmwood Avenue and West Ferry in the heart of Elmwood Village. Some of you may have seen it. We were founded in the years before the city, well, the months before the city was founded. Uh, there were several Unitarian and Universalist churches separate in the city before this one. The land was uh, the last remnant of the John Albright estate. And our architect for this building that was erected in, night started in 1904, ended in 1906 with Edward Austin Kent. He has designed lots of buildings around and he was the, I believe, only Buffalonian who perished in the Titanic sinking. Our architecture, little talk about our architecture because it's, it's kind of surprising. It is both English country, Gothic, revival, and arts and craft. 
So let's talk about <coughs> what does it mean to be English country Gothic revival? If you think about what a Gothic church is, it's the kind of thing that has these the reredos in the front of the church, that wooden screen with all the Brussels sprouts and pointy bits on it and the stained glass and all of those lovely sort of churchy things that you, you feel like, oh yeah, this has got to be about religion, you know, Christian religion. But when you often think of Gothic, you often think of things like Notre Dame or Chartres or even Trinity uh, Episcopal on Delaware, these very soaring experiences, a vertical experience with a Claire story and flying buttresses and all of that stuff. Well, the English didn't do that. They went Gothic, but they kept a, a horizontal plane, a more flat kind of a church. And that's usually, you can see the lower ceilings here. And that's what makes it English country Gothic revival. Imagine. Kathy and Heathcliff stumbling across a church on the moors. And then the arts and craft, you can see the very heavy wooden beams, the hammer beams, and, also, and the plain ornamentation. There's very little ornamentation of carvings and whatnot. And that's very reminiscent of the arts and craft aesthetic. Our architecture reflects our theology. Here are some of our, our stained glass windows. The only two figures who are represented in our stained glass. And the first one over here, the prophet, is Isaiah. And he's telling us all out to go out there and do social justice improve the state of the world, bring peace, bring justice to our land. And then this figure here is from the parable of the sheep. And if you remember, the shepherd brings home his big flock, realizes one little lamb is missing. And rather than leaving that lamb out in the wilderness, goes out and finds the lamb and brings it back. This is such a beautiful reminder of our covenantal faith. We don't have a creed that we say. Instead, we have a covenant. We have promises we make to each other about how we will be together, how we will journey together on the religious quest. And if one of us steps out of covenant, we don't just let them go like the little lamb off in the wilderness. We go after them and say, hey, would you like to come back? This is the covenant that we agreed to. Is there something wrong with the covenant? Do we need to change the covenant? How can we be in community again? And so our covenant is constantly changing and evolving. And then the middle stained glass window, it, it's part of the Beatitudes. It says, for they shall be comforted. And all along the largest part of our sanctuary, you'll see stained glass windows that have phrases from the Beatitudes. We tend to not reflect too deeply on the miracles of Jesus, but we spend a lot of time thinking about the ethical teachings and the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount is full of them. Finally, about the stained glass, and I'm just using this as an example. So many of the churches in Buffalo are blessed with beautiful stites and Tiffany glass with the opalescence. Ours are not like that. Ours are very plain, clear glass, maybe painted. And that is because Unitarians believe in the clear light of the divine shining through. So here we are. And there we are in worship. We worship together. We love music. We have a strong music program with a large choir, 
soloists. We invite members of the BPO to be part of our services twice a year when we're meeting in person. And uh, every now and then we let our hair down and bring in the band. Oh, and you can see our gigantic organ there in the choir loft as well. And we have lots of families. There are 70, seven zero kids active in our faith, uh, children and youth faith program. And that's on Zoom. Normally we're up to 100, but we've got such a dynamic program going and uh, multi-generational experiences. And we do social justice, lots of different things. Here's some examples. We were one of the first, if not the first church to be uh, represented in the Pride Parade. We very happily sport a Black Lives Matter banner on our building and have done so for ooh, getting on three years now, I think. We are partners with many social justice organizations in the city, including Voice Buffalo. And because our fifth principle is that we affirm and promote the democratic process in our congregations and in society at large, we often are places for um, voter registration as well as a polling place. And that is all I feel like I really need to say. Um, that's me in one of our uh, response rallies this summer. And thank you very much for coming. Uh, you can visit our website for any other information that you want to know. And I definitely want to credit Karen Streach for all the photos. And that is my presentation. And Joan, that was a wonderful presentation. We thank you. Uh, uh, do we, Leah, do we have any questions from the audience? We do not have any questions. Well, uh, <laughs> that your church is um, a landmark. I mean, it really is in Buffalo and certainly uh, uh, in the Elmwood Village. Uh, and uh, living in that village, I, I appreciate all the activities that you do. Uh, do You've moved around. You are probably uh, 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 the speaker. Dennis, I... can can I say something? Please. Who have we got? Dennis, can you hear me? I can. Who's speaking? Uh, it's Dr. Bonnie Flickinger, and I think that it was my children's great grandfather that saved the church during the Depression. I think he contributed thirty thousand dollars, so the church would not go bankrupt. That's a wonderful backstory, uh, Dr. Flickinger, that uh, Bonnie, thank you very much for that. Uh, we, we're all beneficiaries of his generosity, let's put it that way. Um, and that's really why I do this Imagine series. Uh, we are where we are, we're going someplace, we imagine what that is, but we need to appreciate uh, that it's always on the shoulders of a lot of people that have uh, done things, uh, most of them we will never know about, but that's one interesting detail, Bonnie, that uh, uh, we appreciate knowing. Uh, anybody else uh, have something? Because I do have to wrap it up. We have time constraints. Um, and so I will- uh, We do have one question. Go ahead. Um, they say, please define Godhead as compared with God. Did you hear that all right? Yes, yeah, I did. All right, so, huh, that's a really good question. So the Trinity is often described as the Godhead in that it is, it's this personage, but it's in three people. And I don't actually know the difference I wouldn't necessarily say functionally or theoretically, there is a difference. God exists in three and in one at the same time. That's part of the Christian mystery in the Trinitarian faith. The Unitarians felt that that, that mystery was too complicated and didn't make a whole lot of sense to them. And so they rejected it. 
And that's been going on, as I say, since 325 and before. Mystery is a good word. Uh, there's an element of that, certainly. And that's what faith is, uh, the belief uh, to a degree in mystery. Uh, the unity of the Holy Spirit is what Christians often pray to. So uh, that seems to hold uh, certainly yourself and, and, uh, and quite a bit and just about uh, uh, everything else in that spirit. So, uh, boy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and thank you, Joan, for a, a, a great presentation. We so appreciate this new format. Uh, join us next week, same time, same Zoom link, when we talk with uh, John Zach. Uh, many of you will remember him as uh, involved with the media. Uh, he's the author, most recently, of The Day the Buffalo River Burned, uh, which was dedicated to the efforts of the late Stan Spesiak. I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well and have a great afternoon.